Hello everyone and welcome to this Monday's mini episode of the Nurtured by Nature podcast. If like me and you're interested in environmental politics, you'll probably be aware that over recent weeks and months there have been two rather large UN gatherings with a focus on the environment. A few weeks ago COP27 was held in Egypt and currently there is COP15 for the UN Convention on Biological Diversity happening in Montreal. One of the reasons for my starting this podcast has been my sadness and frustration when I've seen these large environmental conferences taking place and the action, or should I say lack of action, that has resulted from the gatherings and negotiations feels at a time when we need to be doing more feels completely disheartening. My first interest in or awareness of these UN conferences came actually from when I was doing my A-levels in the UK and I was studying politics and in my spare time became involved in the Model United Nations movement and even at that age I was hugely interested in the environment so I looked into the environmental policies things like the Paris Agreement and I was surprised even then to realise that some what I would consider developed nations were quite reticent in their commitment to the environment and even now decades later there's a still a huge reluctance on that international level. There's a realisation that something needs to be done but the crux of it is it comes down to economics and the issue that we have created by all these borders I talk in the podcast that I'm releasing on Friday with Philippa Ross about the oceans and how the international boundaries cause challenges for responsibility. Who will take responsibility? And perhaps it depends how you look at it, I suppose, whether it's better or worse on land where those boundaries are are clearly defined. We still have the challenges of whose responsibility it is because the problem with the environmental problems that we're seeing is what one country does impacts people beyond their own borders. I know that COP27 in Egypt was a very challenging event for negotiators. Something that was high on the agenda was discussion around compensation over losses for climate change. The EU actually proposed the establishment of a loss and damage fund, which they hope to have operational within two years but only if other countries had agreed to a stronger ambition to stay within the 1.5 degree limit. I actually follow a photographer who does a lot of photography at the UN climate negotiation events and I enjoy reading her observer view of the negotiations. She's very passionate about the climate herself and so comes at it with a a great understanding of the subject matter but it is a fascinating challenge historically it's always been about the developed nations providing the funding but something that she explained was that and I hadn't understood and perhaps you haven't either is that my concept of developed and developing nations and by developing nations they are absolved from providing funding was actually established 30 years ago and things have changed. It's China for example. I had no idea that it's still classified as a developing nation but it has now grown to be the second largest economy and also carbon emitter in the world but because of its developing nation status it's potentially exempt from contributing to things like the fund for loss and damage. It's a difficult situation and one that can leave those of us that care about the natural world feeling even more hopeless that nothing is ever going to be done on that level. The current COP15 in Montreal 
the Convention on Biological Diversity is perhaps even more concerning for many of us. We'll be all very much aware that we're facing a biodiversity crisis. On the whole, diversity has declined 60 to 70 percent since the 1970s. More than a million plant and animal species are now threatened with extinction. We need drastic action and we're just not seeing that on the larger governmental corporation level. And perhaps it comes down to who are these people are accountable to? They have these conventions yearly or on a slightly less frequent cycle. I think they're aware of the issues. Obviously, they are having the conferences. But again, it comes down to people needing to put this ahead of economies. And when we have governments that have quite a short-termist view, it's hard to get them to agree to putting vast sums of money aside Last year's COP was actually in Glasgow in the UK, which was a lot closer to home and I think brought it to the forefront of a lot of people's minds in this country. As a wildlife photographer, I was actually fortunate enough to have one of my images exhibited at the COP and I became aware of a whole another side of these conferences, the amount of grassroots non-governmental organisations that come along and campaign that side of it is is truly fascinating that's where we perhaps need to start looking for our solutions is realizing that as individuals on a grassroots level we can make a difference and i thought it would be good to highlight some good news stories about biodiversity and organizations that have actually had success perhaps people that you can get behind or as I was reminded with a conversation with Helen from Happy Seal Yoga which I'll be releasing next week I was reminded to consider my own perspective and be aware of what you're looking for the negative dialogue that we're often presented with around these conferences particularly from mainstream media can leave us feeling like there is absolutely no hope at all I thought, I don't want that to be the message that you all have, especially at this time of year when we're often thinking about our goals and intentions for the year ahead, how perhaps we can make changes in our own lives, what we want to continue to prioritise or indeed let go of in our lives. So I thought I'd I'd mention a few organisations and species that I'm aware of myself personally, give you an idea that people can come together and they can make a difference. The first one is the mountain gorillas. Now, the gorillas are only found in three countries in the world, Rwanda, Uganda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. All of those countries have faced their own challenges. And in fact, in the 1970s and 1980s, when Diane Fossey was at prominence, trying to raise awareness for the plight of mountain gorillas, There were only a few hundred left in the world. But today, numbers have exceeded over a thousand and they're considered the only great ape in the world whose numbers are increasing. This has not come easily. It's been hard work. There's been community involvement, governments, many NGOs. But their work is paying off. They're making a difference. The numbers of these animals are increasing and there's a brighter future for them as a result. Another wonderful example from Africa is the West African giraffe, a subspecies of the northern giraffe that's only found in Niger. Back in the 1990s, there were just 49 West African giraffe left in the world. They do not occur in any zoos, and they only occur in a small area near the capital city, and they live in amongst the communities there. The government of Niger has been committed, though, to ensuring their survival. And they've worked with many NGOs, including the Giraffe Conservation Foundation. And now the numbers have increased to over 600. Again, a fantastic example of how when people are committed and come together, they are able to make a difference and protect species from extinction. A little bit closer to home, in fact, outside my home windows, There's also the wonderful story of the red kites, a bird that was driven close to or to extinction in 
parts of the UK. I remember when I first moved to the village here back in the mid 90s and a little while after we moved here a pair of red kites flew over. They were in the area for probably about two days and we had twitchers from all across the country descend on the village. The roads into and out of the village were lined with cars as people came to see these incredible birds that at that stage were really rare. I now see red kites every single day. I watch them from my, the windows of my house and it's a privilege. I'll never forget the years when they weren't here and the fact that they are here now. They're resident here. They're breeding successfully and that again is a wonderful example that we can reverse these trends. Many of you might also be aware of the Nep estate in the southern part of England. They are known mostly for their amazing rewilding efforts. Those rewilding efforts are creating huge gains in biodiversity. They are seeing species that were incredibly rare and endangered, finding strongholds by just allowing nature to take the lead, giving nature the space and time to recover itself. Some of the species include many rare butterflies and like many of you will know the insect populations in particular have crashed and that has cascading effects throughout the entire ecosystem. Several of the other species doing well include birds, birds like the turtle doves which have become almost extinct in this country. The breeding pairs, I think, have reduced by 98% from where they once were. It's perhaps interesting to note that donations, although they're increasing, the donations that go to charitable organisations involved in environmental causes make up less than 5% of all the charitable donations in this country. So whilst we might think that we can't do very much, actually just seeking out the environmental organisations and charities that are out there making a difference, already achieving these amazing results with really quite minimal amounts of funding. If you can find a way to support them, even if it's a small amount of money, or even just getting out there and finding them on social media, giving them some encouragement, sharing their messages, educating other people that you speak to, that can make a huge difference. So I would encourage you, as perhaps you go into the new year, to do some research for yourself. Perhaps look up some of the organisations I've mentioned and look into others. Find ones that resonate with you and the aspects of the environment that you love and do what you can to encourage and support them. Because together, I truly believe that we can make a difference and we can turn the tide and we can make sure that the environment is not just protected but is restored and we can leave a legacy that we're all proud of. So with that in mind, I will wish you a very Merry Christmas. I will be back with you next week and on Friday I'll be sharing an episode from my dear friend Philippa Roth from New Zealand. I hope you have a lovely week and I look forward to catching up with you again on Friday. Thank you so much for listening to the Nurtured by Nature podcast. I truly hope this conversation has brought some hope and inspiration into your life. I would love to have these messages ripple out across the world. So if you can, please share this episode with your friends, leave a review on your favourite podcast player and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. I would love to hear from you, so please feel free to connect with me on the links provided in the podcast description. But most importantly, thank you so much for being a part of this journey with me. But don't forget to simply get out there and enjoy the natural world.